Well, hello, Grace Point family. I miss you all like crazy and uh, can't wait the, until we're get, get together, uh, together again in our building, worshiping as the body of Christ. Looking forward to that day coming soon. Please know that I miss you all very much, and I am looking forward to getting together again. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us today, we are really glad that you're here. My name is Tom. Thank you for giving us a few minutes on this Sunday morning to share God's word with you today in a moment. We'll have our Sunday morning message. We would encourage you, please, to have your Bible. Uh, study along with us. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to get one to you. You can message us here on our page. Please let us know you'd like a Bible. Let us know where you're located, whether you're here in Napanee or whether you're someone else, somewhere else, wherever it might be. And uh, we'll do whatever we have to do to get it to you. So if you'd like a Bible, please, please let us know. Also want to remind you uh, that FCDC's pantry is open and is receiving donations of non-perishable food items. Uh, they're really looking for crackers and jelly and cereal, especially kid-friendly cereal. Uh, they're looking for those items. Um, but of course, they're going to take pretty much anything that you would like to donate to them in the, in the way of non-perishable food items. And you can take them directly to FCDC, and they will meet you right outside, and they'll take your items for you. When you go, please let them know that if you're one of our members, that you're here from Grace Point Church. Uh, if you're going to FCDC and donating some food items, uh, please let them know if you're with a different church. Please let them load the name of your church because they want to record that information. And then also, please, we'd ask everybody to please continue to pray for FCDC and for its clients. FCDC is considered an essential service here in Napanee, so their doors have remained open, and they are serving the people of Nap Napanee, especially the people who are uh, the ones who are in greatest need. And so we continue to ask for your blessing. Uh, we pray for uh, God's blessing upon those who are clients of FCDC. Also, we would encourage you, please, to message, uh, message us on Facebook. If there is anything that we can be in prayer about for you, it would be our privilege to pray with you and to pray for you. So please let us know. Now let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning, a people who are reliant upon you and upon your grace and your mercy. Father, you made us, and you made us in your image, and you sustain us, and you pour out your blessing upon us. Father, you grant us your love and compassion. Father, you have given us provision for our lives, and for this, Father, we are thankful today. Father, thank you for so moving in our lives that we see your hand upon us and we understand and comprehend the blessing that you have poured out to us, Father. You have been gracious to your people and for this we give you praise and honor and glory today. Father, uh, you are the God who forgives and we are a forgiven people because you have poured out your mercy upon your people. Father, thank you for forgiving our sins and thank you, Father, for making us new creations in Christ that we might go uh, living our lives in boldness and in courage, according to your word, Father, thank you for strengthening us and equipping us to serve you in this way. Father, we desire to serve because the need in our community is great. Father, we ask your blessing upon our church members, each and every single one that are in great need today. We also ask your blessing upon those who live here in Napanee. Father, would you minister to these families? Father, for those who are hurting and are broken and are brokenhearted, Father, we ask your blessing today. Would you pour out your mercy upon this community as you have done, Father? Continue to do so. Father, this morning uh, we think of all of those who are serving on the front lines fighting the virus. We thank you for doctors and nurses. We thank you, Father, for first responders. We thank you, Father, for people working in labs seeking a virus, a, a, a vaccine, or seeking a cure. We thank you for each one of these, Father. And we pray your blessing upon them. Father, would you equip them and strengthen them to do the work you have called them to do. That we may be people blessed by their efforts, we pray. Father, we just thank you for the um, many blessings you have poured out. We thank you for all of the people who have recovered from this virus. And we thank you, Father, for communities that seek to recover financially and economically from the devastation that has been brought upon our country and father we pray your blessing upon each community thank you for the way you have blessed our community here in Napanee and we ask father for your continued blessing father we do lift up this morning those who are fighting this virus who are dealing with it 
who are struggling under the, uh, under the weight of it. And Father, we ask for your healing upon them. Would you comfort them and strengthen them uh, and bring healing to them at this time, we pray. Father, for all of those who have lost loved ones during this time, um, we grieve with them. And Father, we ask that you would be gracious and merciful to, to each one. So, Father, uh, we ask your blessing upon this world and upon our nation and upon your people. Father, would you pour out your mercy upon this land? Would you rid us of this virus, we pray, and strengthen us that we might serve you all our days? Father, if we turn our attention to God's word, for in it we find strength and in it we find hope. We thank you, Father, for the blessing of your word. And we pray, Father, that as we read it, that our hearts would be open to it and that we would be encouraged by it and strengthened to serve you according to it. Father, for your servant who brings your word to your people, forgive my sins for there are many. Grant me your Holy Spirit, I pray, so that the words I speak would not be mine, but they would be yours. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably upon your church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility your plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that the things which were cast down are being raised up, and the things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bible this morning to Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Exodus, of course, the second book of the Old Testament, in our ongoing series in Exodus, and today we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 2, and we'll be reading today verses 1 through 10 of that text. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and this is God's word. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older... She took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And may God add his blessing to the reading of this, his holy word. We are continuing our sermon series, which we've entitled Declaration and Deliverance. It's a study of the book of Exodus, and we'll be going through the first 15 chapters of Exodus in this particular study. And as we begin today, let's look for just a few minutes at a term that we're using here to describe God. Throughout Exodus, we will describe God as sovereign. Throughout the Bible, we see God as the sovereign, the one who has the highest power and authority. And we see references to God's sovereignty throughout the Bible, many, many places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. For example, Psalm 71, verse 16, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. And then we see a reference in the New Testament in Jude, verse, verse 4, where Jude describes Jesus as our only sovereign and Lord. And our hymns reflect this faith in our sovereign, our King, and our Lord. One of the great hymns of the church, written by Matthew Bridges, a 19th century British-Canadian hymn writer, he wrote, Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. Now, certainly there's language in that hymn that we do not use anymore. 
I mean, the word potentate, the one who rules, rules by power and by authority. And the word like ineffable, which is indescribable. It's incapable of being expressed in words, something that's ineffable. And then, of course, the word sublime, something that inspires great admiration or awe. Yeah, those are words we don't use anymore in our language. You're not going to find them popping up on your Facebook page. Well, you might hear in, in, this, in this video. But other than that, you're not going to find these words anywhere. Words we don't use any longer, certainly not in this day. Why is that? It's because no one else meets these requirements. The one who meets those requirements, the one who is, def who is demonstrated by those terms, has already made himself known. There's no other reason to use those terms because there's no one else that we can describe in that way other than God himself. There's nothing else that justifies the use of those words. Jude was right when he pointed to us, pointed out that Jesus is our only sovereign and Lord. Now last Sunday we were in Exodus chapter 1 and there we read of the horrific orders given by Pharaoh, orders which were progressively heinous. First we saw that the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. Next we read of their work as slaves becoming more toilsome. Then we read of the order given to Hebrew midwives to kill newborn Hebrew baby boys. And then finally as the chapter concluded, chapter 1, Pharaoh directs Egyptian citizens to actively engage in putting Hebrew infant boys to death by throwing them into the Nile River. Something we didn't mention last week but we'll include here is that by throwing the Hebrew boys into the Nile, the Egyptians understood that they were actually sacrificing the infants to an Egyptian god. The Egyptian god Hapi was the god of the flooding of the Nile. The flooding of the Nile was an annual occurrence which deposited fertile soil along the Nile riverbanks that occurred every, every spring. So the casting of Hebrew infant boys into the Nile was wholesale murder with the added benefit of the apparent appeasement of the Egyptian god. Now the placing of the story here in Exodus chapter 1, countered by the story of the birth, birth and rescue of the little boy in Moses, Exodus chapter 2, provides us with this great contrast the intention of Pharaoh is death, but the covenant of God is life. The, the scheme of Pharaoh is murder, but the sovereign plan of God is rescue. The trajectory for the Egyptians, however, is Pharaoh leading them to defeat. But the trajectory for the Israelites, as we will see, is the sovereign God leading them to blessing. Death versus life. The big picture of Exodus here confronts us with this very question, does it not? And it's also a theme that will appear again and again. Even in these first 15 chapters of Exodus, there's a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, a lot of activity concerning life and death. So hold on tight, kids. Take small children by the hand if you're a little squeamish about this. Death versus life is a question we are confronted with over and over again here in Exodus. So today our message is entitled, A Little Child Shall Lead Them. And our sermon outline breaks down this way, verses 1 and 2, we'll read the promise continues. Verses 2 through 6, rescued from the waters. Verses 6 through 9, the family reunited. And then verse 10, the prince of Egypt. And then at the end, we'll look at seeing Jesus in Exodus. So recall the scene which we left the study of Exodus chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 1 of Exodus. Exodus 1, Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born you must throw into the Nile. And make no mistake, it's an ungodly king and an ungodly people and an ungodly nation that is such callous disregard for life. Why don't we throw children into the river because we don't want their gender or because we don't like their skin color or because they possess some birth defect or because they're left-handed? or because they have red hair, or because having them will unnecessarily interrupt our self-centered lifestyles, or because, well, gee, it's just not a good time for all of this. My friends, it's an ungodly king and an ungodly people and an ungodly nation that has such callous disregard for life.
But then we go on to chapter 2, and we do notice the contrast. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. In Exodus chapter 2, we read that the parents have decided for life. Their names were Amram, Amram and Jochebed. The couple had previously given birth to two, two children, a girl named Miriam and a boy named Aaron. Now they have a third child, and he too is a boy, but this, of course, brings with it a particular problem. And the problem, here's a couple, a very courageous couple, that determines to marry and have children while in Egypt, while enslaved, and then conceives again, giving birth to another boy, but this time the boy is under the death sentence for any Israelite male newborns. We're being introduced here to another Bible of Counts, of God placing before God's people and before the world that God reveals his sovereign plan to all with these most unassuring settings. God's done this before in the Bible. He's going to do it again in the Bible. Time and time again, God rolls out his plan and we see him roll out his plan. We look at it, we say, oh, come on. <laughs> really? Is this your plan, God? Is this how you're going to... Take care of your people. This is how you're going to bless your people. This is how you're going to rule and reign over all of creation. This is how you're going to right all the wrongs. This is how you're going to do this, by rolling out a plan in this way. God shows his plan with, with all these most unassuring settings. God has done this before. God will do it again. Remember the story of David when God ordered Samuel to anoint David as the future king of Israel. David, of course, at this time was yet a young boy working out in the fields as a shepherd. But 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected the others. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now about debating with God concerning his plans... Do we not do this all the time? How often, when we pray, do we really say something like this, God, I've already figured it out for you. Here's the plan I want you to follow. If you follow it out this way and do it in this order and do it as quickly as possible, we'll all be very happy. And we'll, of course, we'll give you the glory for it. But we want you to do things in this way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's kind of the way we typically do these things. But then, of course, the word of God comes screaming back at us when we try to do that. Isaiah 55, 8 and 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and does not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood and bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire, and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So here already in verses 1 and 2, we see God displaying his sovereign work of covenant fulfillment. God has declared his covenant. God is carrying out his covenant. And he's declaring, uh, he's displaying his sovereign work. He is the one who has the power and the authority to do this, and nobody's going to stop him. God's promise continues, God's promise to his people. Now let's look at verses 2 through 6. We see rescued from the waters. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Look at, um, the, there's an explanation, a further explanation in the New Testament. This comes to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23. Look what it says. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, why do the parents hide their baby boy? What is their motivation for doing that? What, what, what is uh, motivating them to do this? Well, we see three things here in the text. First, we see that they acted by faith. You see that in the, in the verse. It says, where did their faith lie? This is the verse in Hebrews. So they acted by faith. Where did their faith lie? Well, their faith lied in the promise of God to carry out his covenant, his plan for his people. And we looked at this last week, and we would do well to look at it again. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. 
I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And we looked at this last week and we noticed that there are four particulars here in God's covenant. First, the, the land, go to the land I will show you. Second, nation, I will make you into a great nation. Third, blessing, I will bless you, I will make your name great. And then fourth, there was an extension of that blessing. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is the promise that the baby at Moses' parents are hanging on to. So they believe this, so by faith they act in this way. His parents also, we see that the parents saw that he was no ordinary child. They know that there's something special about this boy and about something that God is going to, God's going to use this boy in some sort of way. But also we see that his parents were not afraid of the king's edict. They're not persuaded by the weight of Pharaoh's declaration. They pay no heed to Pharaoh himself. Their faith is in their sovereign God. We would do well here to ask the question, so where does my faith lie? Where does my faith lie? The, the parents of the young baby boy acted by faith, believing that God was going to do what he promised he was going to do. You and I would ask the question, where does my faith lie? Or perhaps more accurately, we would ask, in whom does my faith lie? Now, we've struggled with this question over the years, um, and even here in our church, we have considered uh, some uh, wisdom over the years that has uh, attempted to answer this question. Earlier this week, our, our statement of faith came out of the Heidelberg Catechism, and question 21 asked, what is true faith? And the answer that we read in the Catechism, and it would be good wisdom for all of us, is this. True faith is a sure knowledge whereby I accept is true all that God has revealed to us in his word. And at the same time, it is a firm confidence that only, not only to others, but also to me, God has granted forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation out of mere grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. This faith, the Holy Spirit, works in my heart by the gospel. Now, when we look at this answer, it's clear to see that God is the one who is working. We're asking the question, what does it mean for us to have faith? And the answer comes back, well, God is the one who's doing the work. True faith is sure knowledge whereby except is true all that God has revealed to us in his word. So the, the, the answer here, in other words, is that faith, is, faith only has substance or only has value when our faith is in someone in whom our faith is worthy. And God comes to us and reveals himself to us, makes himself known to us. And we see here as he's carrying out his plan of redemption, his plan of his sovereign will for his people, his covenant, that, that the baby's parents place their faith in him because they trust in him to do what he's promised he's going to do. Faith, therefore, is not something that's about us. Yes, we exercise faith, but we're not the object of faith. Do not place your faith in your faith. Believers in Jesus, Christ Jesus is the one who has won the victory. And it is in him that our faith rests. So the question is, what is true faith? The answer must be, in, the answer must be another question. In whom does your faith lie? Verse 3, but when she could hide him no longer, you can't keep an infant quiet and hidden for only so long. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Notice that Jochebed has met the requirement of Pharaoh's edict. Although she has placed him there rather than thrown him there, her baby boy is now riding along in the current and the crocodiles. Her baby boy is now in the Nile River. Notice the description of the basket. The word used here in the original language that we've interpreted as basket is a word that appears in only one other location in the Old Testament. And that would be Genesis chapter 6 through 9. The word used here is the same word for ark. Interesting. It's the word for basket. The, the basket that the baby was put in, in the river, is the same word for ark. And we know that story, of course, from Noah and the ark. And we do see some similarities between the appearance of Noah's ark and Mo, Mo, uh, Moses' basket. Both are used as a lifeboat for the main character. Both have no steering mechanism, 
and both successfully deliver the main character through the hazardous waters. Again, the events here read on the surface like an act of desperation, but as we continue in the story, we see God's sovereign hand all over this story. And even in the placing of the basket and the basket moving through the water, we see God's sovereign hand guiding and directing. The basket comes to rest along the riverbank, and the text describes for us the events taking place surrounding this basket. Verse 4, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. Pharaoh's daughter has compassion for this baby, and this compassion is clearly evident for all to see. Her attendants and her slave girl are even witnesses to this compassion. Now consider this unexpected turn of events. Pharaoh orders the death of all Hebrew infant boys by throwing them into the water. Pharaoh's daughter rescues this Hebrew infant boy, deciding not to throw him into the water. And it is same Hebrew infant boy who will grow to be Moses, the leader of the Israelites, who will see the defeat of Pharaoh and the escape of the Israelites. How? Through the water. Now we look at verses 6 through 9. We see the family reunited. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Now remember what we said in verse 4 about Moses' sister Miriam. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And now this brave little girl approaches the daughter of the Pharaoh. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Moses' mother, Jochebed, the very woman who just a short time previously had placed her baby boy in the basket and sent him floating down the river. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman, Jochebed, Moses' mother, took the baby and nursed him. She will keep her own baby at home rather than having to put him to death, and she will in fact be paid by Pharaoh's daughter to take him and raise him for a period of time. So after all of this, we see a Hebrew infant boy condemned to die, but instead rescued. Here we see the family, Amram and Jochebed's family, reunited. And though the rescue of this, and through the rescue of this one child, so also will the family of God be reunited. And the family of God, the people of God, will be rescued. And did you notice that God did this and is doing this in Egypt? He's doing this in a foreign land, in a nation, and among an Egyptian citizenry. A citizenry which is littered with the idolatry that is worship of foreign gods. In the midst of all this, God is still at work amongst his people. God is still blessing his people. God is still keeping the covenant promises he made to his people. My friend, God proves again that he can reach you or me wherever we are. True, we may have strayed from him. We may sense at times that we are far away from him. But the truth is that he has never strayed from us. Even in Egypt, God was blessing his people. And now we come to verse 10. The prince of Egypt, God is not done. Look at how the story continues. When the child grew older, he, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So it's several years later, and the boy is taken to Pharaoh's daughter. And though the years have gone by, Pharaoh's daughter still demonstrates compassion for the boy. She remembers the day that she found him in the basket in the Nile. She felt sorry for him then, and she feels compassion for him now. Note that in verse 10 that says that a boy, the boy became her son, not just a resident and not just an orphan and certainly not a slave. He became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, Moses will be raised to be a prince of Egypt. He'll be educated by the finest scholars of Egypt. And he'll be ready for the day when it'll be his turn to lead the nation. But little did Pharaoh know that Moses would indeed lead a nation. Not the nation of Egypt, but instead he would be the leader of the great and mighty nation, 
the people of God. And finally, let's take a few minutes as we see Jesus in Exodus. When we read of this little baby, we fast forward from the birth of Moses some 800 years, and we can't help but think of the prophecy given by Isaiah, a reference to the promise of another baby, another rescuer, a greater deliverer. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will lie with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Isaiah's prophecy. And from Isaiah, we fast forward again another 750 years, and we read of these words recorded in Luke in his gospel, the story of a little Jewish infant boy. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So here's what we've learned today, my friends. Despite the er efforts of a tyrannical pharaoh, this little baby boy, delivered in a basket, would bring deliverance to the children of God. And this points us forward to another little baby boy. And despite the efforts of the devil himself, that little baby boy, delivered in a manger, would bring eternal deliverance to the children of God. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Father, you have graciously brought deliverance to your people. We read of this deliverance in the story of Moses, the way you have delivered him through a most perilous circumstance and a death sentence. And by doing so, you delivered your people from their bondage and into the promised land. And that points us forward to the deliverance we receive through Christ. Father, for this we praise you and we give you glory. May we be reminded again and may we be encouraged to always comprehend and understand and proclaim that deliverance comes through Christ. The one who has brought us grace and mercy. The one who has brought us salvation and reconciliation. In whose name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I would encourage you please to be uh, just receive these words as we go today. This is our blessing from God's word. This is Psalm 107, verses 19 through 22. And, and, and hear these words today. God's people cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word, and he healed them. He rescued them. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for his people. Let them sacrifice offerings of thanks and tell of his works with songs of joy. And all of God's children said, Amen.